lasts for around about 30 minutes, um, after which you can ask uh, questions online. And there'll also be a recording available on our website and on YouTube if you want to revisit this at any point in the future or if you've got colleagues who want to look at it as well. My name is Sarah Anderson. I'm a share scheme solicitor. I've been working in the field of share schemes for um, around nearly 20 years now, focusing almost entirely on share schemes for private companies. And my contact details are here, so you can contact me at any time after the webinar if, if there's any questions that arise. So today, um, this webinar is supposed to be a practical introduction rather than a technical seminar. And I'll be talking about why you might want to introduce a share scheme in the first place and some design considerations you might like to take into account. I'll give a brief summary of the key schemes that are available for private companies and I'll run through some real life why, how, what scenarios based on experiences we've had with our clients in the past. So to begin with, um, if you're a TED Talk aficionado, you've probably come across Simon Sinek and I'm going to blatantly use his theory of start with why to begin with presentation. So the outline argument is you always begin with why before moving on to how, and you do the what last of all. Um, this pretty much corresponds with the approach we normally take to share schemes. So if you translate the why, how, what into, into my world of share plans, you can usually break it down as follows. So the why bit in the middle is why do we want to put in a share plan? So it's typically to get engaged, incentivised employees, although there's sometimes more to the why than just that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so we talk about how we're going to do it. So the intention is you uh, establish a share plan of some type that delivers the appropriate rewards for your employees. And last of all, as to what is what kind of plan you're going to use on the outside ring. So very often we're contacted by clients who already have, or prospective clients rather, who already have or they think they have the what um, answer, which in my world is the type of scheme they want to put in place. And that might be because they've worked somewhere before and benefited from a particular type of scheme, or they've heard about significant tax advantages that attach to a particular type of share plan. And sometimes they've got that what part absolutely right, but sometimes it's not always the right scheme for them because they haven't necessarily looked at the why part first or, or indeed the how. So in share schemes, the answer to the why question is, as I've already said, so we can have engaged, incentivised employees, obviously who wouldn't want engaged, incentivised employees. Sometimes you might want to ask um, a few more questions here as to why you want them so engaged and incentivised. Do you want them working towards particular objectives, which might be um, a corporate sale of the business or to increase growth and profitability within the group or within one company in the group or even within one particular division? Um, are you looking at uh, long-term or short-term objectives or a mixture of the two? And who do you want to be engaged? Is it everybody or just very key employees? Or do you want to engage all employees, but in a slightly different way for each particular group? And do remember that the why doesn't just include your employees. You will also need to take into account the other interests that are involved. So those are the interests of the shareholders and of the company itself. You'll need to be quite sure that the existing shareholders are happy that if they're giving away some of their equity under a share plan, then the overall growth in the company and the reward to the shareholders and investors is commensurate with the dilution they're going to face. So you need to make sure that the interests of the shareholders and the employees are properly aligned. And of course, the company itself should see some benefit from the implementation of the plan. So your corporate objectives should usually form the focus of any plan that you implement. Um, the realisation of reward by the employees uh, should usually be subject to the achievement of required corporate targets, whether that's growth in one particular division or the sale of the company as a whole. So once you're happy with the why questions, the next stage really is the how, and that's working out how your share plan is going to achieve those objectives and how it's going to work for you. And this is all down to design considerations relating to the plan. So for your, for example, um, what do you or all the other shareholders actually want to achieve? What's your ultimate goal? Are you looking to sell? Um, if you're looking to sell, wh when are you planning to do that? And, and to whom? Is it is it part of succession planning or 
Is it part of a series of entrepreneurial adventures? Is the sale going to be an all or nothing arrangement? Um, or is it just a key shareholder looking to take a step back uh, while still retaining some interest in the business? Maybe there's going to be a partial sale to an investor. Um, maybe you're looking at entering into joint venture arrangements. Um, there are plenty of uh, questions to ask here and you need to make sure that you're thinking about how your share plan will get you to that particular point. And you also need to consider whether having employee shareholders might impact on your ability to achieve certain objectives. And when it comes to the plan itself, how is it going to look? Um, as we've noted, is it for everyone or just for the selected few? At what point do you want people to actually have rights to acquire shares? Do you want them to get shares straight away or after a certain time or dependent on performance conditions? Um, are you looking to provide rewards for people who've been loyal to you in the past? Or is the reward entirely dependent on future performance? Or maybe it's a mix of the two. Um, and you need to think about whether you're going to use shares or options. Um, so remember that a uh, share obviously gives employees the rights of shareholders, which might be votes or dividends, although private companies can obviously create a, a different class of shares sometimes for use under a share plan. Um, whereas in comparison to a share, an option is just a promise to acquire shares in the future at a price fixed today. And, and you decide when the time is right for employees to become actual shareholders. That's something you decide at the time of putting the plan in place. Um, maybe they'll get the shares straight away or perhaps after three years to test their loyalty or perhaps when the company's doubled in value to test performance. Or maybe it will only be when the company is sold if that is your one overriding objective. And you will probably also want to think about some more detail points. So for example, how much do you want to give away? How much dilution are you comfortable with? Do you want employees to be able to buy and sell shares by way of an internal share market? What happens if people leave? That's really very important. You need to think about that right at the outset about what happens with leavers and how you deal with them. Uh, also, how long do you think the scheme is going to last and how often do you think you might make awards under the plan? So once you've identified some of those answers to the whys and the hows, you're in a much better position to look at the what's. So uh, these are uh, the key schemes that you can choose to use as a private company. Uh, in some cases, just one will, will do for you. In other situations, depending on the whys and the hows, you might end up having to use more than one arrangement to meet your objectives. So for example, some of the tax advantage schemes here can't be used for non-employees. So I'll look at a couple of examples of those. Um, you can divide the schemes up into various boxes. I've chosen three subsectors here. Plans where you grant options over shares, plans where you let employees buy shares, and plans where you gift shares to employees, that is without them paying anything for the shares that they acquire. So to look at the options box first, um, as noted previously, an option is a promise to buy shares in the future but a price at a price fixed today. Options don't give shareholders any uh, employees any shareholders rights until the participants exercise their option and bought the shares. And the price at which they buy the shares and the timing is generally fixed at the outset. Um, and there can be some flexibility on what type of plan you use if you're going to be using share options. Enterprise Management Incentive or EMI is the plan that we put in place most often. It's very flexible and it's extremely tax efficient. Uh, under EMI, you can grant options over different classes of shares and you can attach any performance conditions you want to, ranging from the very simplest exit only option, ex option where you can only exercise the option if the company is sold, right through to time based or performance conditions. You can also choose the exercise price at which the options are granted, although there will be a tax charge on exercise if that price is less than the market value of the shares at the date the options are granted. The default tax treatment for EMI is that there's no tax on the exercise of the option. And when the shares are eventually sold, all the gains are subject to capital gains tax rather than income tax and pot potential national insurance contributions. In addition, participants should also benefit from entrepreneurs relief, ensuring an ultimate tax rate of only 10%, even if the participants hold less than 5% of the company's share capital, which is the usual requirement to get entrepreneurs relief. 
So you can see why we recommend EMI for companies that qualify. So broadly, smaller, independent companies with fewer than 250 employees. The next uh, share option plan on that list, the company share option plan, is the next most tax efficient option plan available. It doesn't have quite the same tax advantages as EMI, um, so it doesn't give entrepreneurs relief, for example, and the limits are lower. So you can only grant £30,000 worth of options every three years to each participant uh, rather than the 250k limit for EMI. And CSOP isn't as flexible, so you can't usually create a different class of, say, non-voting shares to use under a company share option plan as you can for EMI. But if the company is too big for EMI, or if it carries out a certain type of trade, doesn't qualify for EMI, CSOP may well be the next best thing. CSOP and EMI are both owned at employees, and they can usually only be used in a top company in a group. So if you've got non-employees who you want to participate in a scheme, or if your company is a subsidiary of another company, you can't usually grant those tax advantage share options. You could use a non-tax advantaged uh, share option plan, sometimes known as an unapproved share option, to mirror the effect of EMI or CSOP, but the gains will be subject to income tax and potentially NICS rather than CGT. Um, or you could use a phantom share option plan. Um, to be honest, this isn't much more than a cash-based plan, but with the payout based on the increase in the share value, it's, it's flexible, but it's not tax efficient. Um, it does also require you to have an idea about your share value, which to my mind makes it not much more than a complicated bonus plan. Um, while we're talking about options, you will probably also have heard um, of share save or SAYE or uh, save as you earn, which is an all employee tax advantage share option plan. But I've not covered this plan in this webinar because it's not really appropriate for private companies. It's generally used by larger listed companies. Moving on to the next column, if you want participants to benefit from direct shareholdings, it's um, possibly appropriate to ask them to make some kind of financial commitment when they buy the shares. So a plan that we sometimes use um, is the deferred share purchase plan. And this has one advantage in that it's not just for employees, you can use it for consultants as well. Uh, this involves participants committing to pay the current market value for the shares but deferring the payment itself until a later date, and that payment's left outstanding as a loan from the company. So that arrangement has various advantages. Um, as I've said, it can be offered to non-employees as well as employees. It um, allows payments for the shares to be made at a time when the participants have the money. So for example, they could pay their loan off out of dividends received on the shares. Um, the future gains, importantly, are subject to capital gains tax rather than income tax, which would be the situation if a non-tax advantage share option were used. The big downside of the deferred share purchase plan is that there's a financial risk. So if the value of the shares goes down, the participants are still on the hook for the amount owing. So this isn't a scheme we'd necessarily recommend for anyone other than senior employees or consultants. Uh, an alternative might be the use of growth shares. This is a slightly more complicated arrangement. It usually involves amending the company's articles to create a new share class, um, which will only attain value once the company hits certain hurdles. So for example, the share value has increased beyond a certain predefined level. The theory is that until those hurdles are reached, the shares carry very little value. So the employees pay very little when they acquire the shares to begin with. And again, because they're shareholders, they will be subject to capital gains tax on the gains that they make. You can also use growth shares inside an EMI wrapper uh, to get the participants to benefit from entrepreneur's relief. The downside of the growth share arrangements is that the drafting of the share rights can be a bit more complicated and a bit more expensive. And at the moment, although HMRC seem quite happy to accept these plans, um, there is no guarantee that they won't review them in the future. The accepted view in the marketplace is that the arrangements are perfectly valid, but you can never say never when it comes to HMRC. And then finally, there's the uh, government recognised tax advantage plan called the Share Incentive Plan, or SIP, which allows employees to buy shares out of their pre-tax salary. <clears throat> this is the only share plan with government blessing that covers the purchase of shares. It's an extremely tax efficient plan and it provides the opportunity for employees to receive and sell shares in their employee and company completely tax free. The SIP straddles both these columns for purchase and the gift, because as well as letting employees buy shares, it also allows a company to gift shares to its employees. 
So without the employees paying a penny for those shares, and also without them paying any income tax or national insurance contributions on the value of that gift. And the plan can be used in a number of ways. So employees can be given up to £3,600 worth of free shares each year. They can buy up to £1,800 worth of shares at a pre-tax salary. That's the partnership shares. And for every partnership share that they buy, they can be gifted a further two shares known as matching shares. So again, without any tax arising. So employees could receive up to £9,000 worth of shares in their employing company each year, but they only very, pay a very small fraction of that amount by paying for the partnership shares out of their pre-tax salary. So, of course, the government is only going to give away tax breaks like that if you jump through some hoops. So SIP has to be made available to all employees broadly on a similar basis, so fairly and equitably. And that's not for everybody. Um, also, the full tax breaks are only available if the shares have been held by the employees for a minimum of five years. <clears throat> In addition, the plan requires a separate trust to be set up to hold the shares on behalf of the employees. So the SIP is a long term plan. Um, and because it's flexible, it can end up being reasonably complicated. So it does need a reasonable amount of administration and care running it. But if you're looking to reward all of your employees in a tax efficient way, and perhaps looking at something a little bit like the John Lewis partnership, SIP can be an excellent solution. Even more of a John Lewis solution is the relatively new employee ownership trust. This is a trust that acquires a controlling interest in a company, so more than 50% of the shares, and that is held on behalf of all of the employees. This kind of plan doesn't involve individual share ownership because the trust holds the shares for the employees, but it is possible to run other tax advantage schemes alongside it, including EMI. Um, the particular tax advantage for employees is that uh, an EOT controlled company can pay bonuses of up to £3,600 each year without any income tax charge arising. The big tax break for an EOT, however, is for the selling shareholders. Individuals who transfer a controlling interest in a company into the EOT will pay no capital gains tax on such a transfer. So for retiring shareholders, particularly those wishing to keep the existing company running sustainably and for the long term, an EOT can be a very attractive alternative to the more traditional trade sale or, or liquidation. Well, this is all pretty theoretical stuff, so I thought it might be helpful if we looked at a couple of real life scenarios uh, that we've come across and explained how different plans can meet different objectives. So let's start by looking at the startup business. We've got Nicola and Vicky, we've got a lovely new restaurant chain. They've got three restaurants so far. They're anticipating rapid growth. They've got some outside investors and they're wanting to sell in about five years time. They want all their staff to work towards that ultimate goal of a sale and to reap the benefit later. And they're typically cash that for any new startup business. That's not surprising. And they need to hire a good finance director to get their business in shape, but they don't really have that much money to hire somebody. Uh, they also have a non-executive director who's happy to help for a minimum payment, providing he's going to get some kind of equity in return. So that's why they want to set up a plan. How are they going to do it? Well, they want employees only to benefit if they sell the company. Uh, Nicola and Vicky aren't going to benefit themselves until then, so that seems only fair. Um, and as majority shareholders, the two founders have already given up some equity to the investors and they don't really want to dilute their control any further. So if they use an option scheme whereby options are only exercisable if the company is sold, that's probably the best approach for them. They want to differentiate between the finance director and the other staff. So, they, I mean, the FD is obviously the most important, but their chefs are important too. And they also want some of their front, and house, front of house and admin staff to be involved too. Um, so as they're growing, they might want to do some equity modelling to ensure that they've got sufficient equity uh, for new joiners, especially bearing in mind the restaurant trade. You've got people joining and leaving the whole time. They do need to take account of how they're going to deal with levers and what impact that might have. Um, so they'll need to also take that into account when they're looking at lever provisions in their scheme. The non-executive director won't be able to benefit from a tax advantage share scheme for employees, so they'll need to think of something different for him. 
something ideally that will mean he's paying capital gains tax rather than income tax because I've yet to come across a non-exec director who's happy to take an income tax hit. He will almost certainly be looking for capital gains tax treatment. And finally, they need to take into account the investors' views. The investors don't have a majority state, but they do need to be on board. So they'll need to know about any impact on their shareholdings and potential dilution issues. So what are they going to do? Uh, an EMI option with options exercisable only on an exit is probably ideal for this company. Um, the plan's discretionary, so they can differentiate between staff, including the FD. They can include part-time workers, provided that those people spend the majority of their working time with the company and don't work for anybody else. They can have rules stating that options lapse if anybody leaves for any reason whatsoever. But if they want to keep, keep the um, FD a bit happier or treat him differently and allow him to retain some options, even if he's left, they can drift, draft different conditions in his individual option agreement if they want to do so, as that's perfectly possible under an EMI arrangement. As regards uh, valuation, it should be possible to agree a low valuation with HMRC for EMI to maximise the EMI rewards. So the lower the price, uh, the higher the potential gain to participants and the smaller percentage of the equity that needs to be used in the plan. Sometimes you have to be a bit careful if you've had investors putting investment into the company at a higher rate. But often at this startup stage, you can agree with HMRC that that investment is only related to hope value and the actual market value of the company based on its profits, which might be minimal or non-existent at this point, is much lower. You have to remember um, EMI is only appropriate for, employee, for the employees, so uh, something different for the non-exec director. Even if the NED was an employee, um, which he probably won't be, he's almost certainly going to be spending time at other businesses as well. So he won't be spending the majority of his working time with the company, which is one of the requirements for an employee uh, participating in EMI. Um, the other thing you need to remember about the NND is he might be happy to invest or take some financial risk if he's happy that the company's going places. So for him, you probably want to consider maybe the deferred share purchase arrangement. So he subscribes for shares directly, but only pays a small amount up front. Um, and the rest of the payments left outstanding as a loan, probably payable once the company is sold for value. So the advantage for the DSPP is that the NED will be a shareholder, so any growth in the value of his shares will be subject to capital gains tax. The disadvantage is that the, sh the loan will have to be paid back at some point, even if the company fails or the share price drops. So the plan has a financial risk, but somebody at NED level might think it's worthwhile given the promise of increase in value. That's our startup. We'll have a quick look at um, mature business. Now, so this is a different stage of the life cycle. Kevin's got a successful, profitable business. He's been growing it for 20 years. He's got a really good management team, but he's starting to think about the sale of the business before he gets too old to sail the world. Um, He'd like to reward his managers um, on two levels. Firstly, on an ongoing basis now to tie them into the company and with an additional reward if they can help him achieve the sale that he needs. So how's he going to set about that? He needs to work out exactly who he needs to reward in the team and at what level. He might want to think if there are other people who sit below the immediate management team who might benefit as well. He needs to build the team's commitment with an intermediate financial reward perhaps for doubt at intervals. And at the same time, he needs to get them to focus on the ultimate aim, the exit, with a promise of a share in the sale proceeds. And um, he might want to ensure the reward only arises if he achieves a certain exit value. So again, EMI may well work here. It was originally designed for smaller, fast-growing businesses, but it's perfectly suitable for decent-sized private companies. As long as Kevin's company doesn't employ 250 or more people, and it's got gross assets of less than £30 million, it's still of a size that can meet the EMI criteria. And because EMI is so flexible and tax efficient, the rule of thumb generally is if you can use it, then do so. So here, Kevin could put in place a plan with a mix of exercise provisions, some relating to immediate or intermediate exercise, and some linked to exercise on exit. So the intermediate exercise could be time-based vesting only or dependent on performance targets, 
maybe with options of becoming exercisable every year, which would allow participants to acquire shares as time goes by and build up their interest in the company. Um, if he's got some really key people who he wants to reward for past loyalty, he could even allow some options to become exercisable immediately. Um, and exercising the options would also demonstrate a commitment by those employees to Kevin and the company. Of course, in order to exercise the options and acquire the shares, the participants do need to pay an exercise price. So in my view, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with asking individuals to make some kind of financial commitment to become a shareholder, particularly if they're senior management level. Um, and given that the company's mature and profitable, there is likely to be some value in the company. So the market value agreed with HMRC is it, it, likely to be something rather than nothing, as, as was the case with the startup. Nonetheless, it's usually possible to agree a discounted value with HMRC for private company shares. So the exercise price would be typically a lot lower than the company, what the company shares might fetch uh, in an exit scenario. Um, alternatively, if the exercise price is deemed to be a bit high for the employees to pay, you can set the exercise price for EMI options at less than the market value. You can even set them with a nil exercise price if you want to do that. Um, the impact of that would be that the participants would be subject to income tax on that discount. But it's still a method of acquiring shares at a much lower price than what you might call the real value. Um, and if Kevin really wanted to be generous, of course, he could always pay a bonus to people to cover off the exercise price so participants aren't out of pocket. But as I say, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with asking people to, to pay um, something to acquire shares in a profitable business, particularly if it's paying out dividends. Um, and the shares that are acquired by these uh, managers could pay dividends. So once their options have been exercised, they put a bit of money in, then there's a possibility of an ongoing financial reward. Um, you could have non-voting shares if Kevin wanted to protect his position as the ultimate controller of the business. Or you could say, um, by giving people votes on their shares, that really does make them feel a little bit more like an owner and might provide a greater degree of commitment and loyalty and motivation than otherwise. As regards the exit part of the options, you could simply allow the options to be um, exercisable if the company was sold for any reason, or uh, Kevin could tie that to a particular value. So, for example, 100 options become exercisable if the company is sold. But if the company is sold for more than, say, 20 million, they are able to exercise an extra 50 options in that scenario. So there's lots of flexibility there. Um, you do need to think with a plan where people are acquiring shares, uh, you need to deal with a little bit of um, extra detail in terms of administration. You need to keep track of when the options are granted, when they're exercised. Um, think about equity modelling and think about how the valuation uh, applies to the reward that people are likely to get. So we're nearly running out of time now. I've got one last case study to have a look at, which is a succession question. <clears throat> Looking at an architect's firm here, established as a traditional partnership structure, partners are looking at retirement, but they might want to retain interest in the business. They want it to carry on running and they're thinking about transferring their business to current employees. I think it's sustainable, it's successful, and they might want some key people to acquire a larger percentage than, than all of the employees. So how do they do that? Clearly, succession planning requires careful thought and planning, uh, and I'm only looking at this from a, a share plan perspective. Um, if they were thinking about a share plan for employees, the uh, partners will firstly need to work out if they want everybody to involve, be involved or just a few people. Is there going to be a baseline for everybody? What will additional rewards be based on how much interest they want to retain, how much they want to get for their shares, and think about the time period, how uh, far into the future they're looking, and how long will it take to transfer the shares into employees' hands if that's what they want to do. And there is clearly no straightforward answer to this because there are an awful lot of detailed questions to be considered, but there are a number of share plans that could be used to help the partners achieve their goals. So a genuine transfer of ownership to all employees a really good alternative to the traditional business sale is the Employee Ownership Trust. Providing the individuals transfer uh, controlling interest in the trust, they will pay no capital gains tax on that transfer. Um, 
they really need to be a requirement to get the company valued, to make sure the partners are getting the value they seek, and also to make sure that the trust isn't paying over the market value. But that's perfectly doable. Once the trust is in place, it holds shares on behalf of all the employees. So no direct share ownership, but the employees can get that tax-free bonus of £3,600 per annum if they want to do that. Um, if you wanted to, alongside that uh, employee ownership trust, you can run top-up EMIs for senior managers. There's no reason why the company can't use the sort of remaining 49% interest to grant shares to, to key employees. Um, if you wanted, if you've got a company that's bigger than 250 EMI, it might not work, but you could certainly use company share option plan instead if you wanted to reward the senior managers more appropriately. Another approach that's a bit more flexible than the EOT might be to use the share incentive plan. So again, that's an all employee plan. It involves a slightly more direct form of share ownership, um, although there is still a trust. Um, there's no requirement, however, for the SIP to acquire um, a controlling interest. So the existing partners could use this as a starting point to build employee interest over time. Um, and while their interest is slowly diluted, they can, they can transfer their own shares into the SIP to make awards to employees. Um, there are additional tax breaks for individuals who transfer a certain percentage of their shareholding into a SIP. So that might be of interest as well. And of course, because of the flexibility we've already discussed with, uh, with relation to SIP, um, it allows employees to buy the shares as well as receive free shares. So they could be required to make a small financial commitment. Um, again, if you wanted to, you could run a SIP and an EMI alongside an employee ownership trust um, to allow people to build up a larger stake in the 49% in the remaining shares in the company. So a succession plan arrangement is obviously fairly complicated because the departing shareholders might have a number of uh, conflicting um, approaches that they want to take. But certainly there are many, many ways of using a share scheme and particularly an employee ownership trust. If you're looking to build a sustainable business in the future, um, architects firms at the moment are really embracing the employee ownership trust as, a, as an alternative uh, to the traditional partnership role and as a way of helping uh, retiring partners uh, get out of the firm and pass on to the next generation of, of owners. So um, how about set out some of the most important issues to think about when putting in place a share scheme in private companies? Um, just three things to take away. Um, always look at the why first. Um, unless you've worked out what your key objectives are, um, then you can't really work out the solution to, to your questions. So always look at the design issues first and what you're looking to achieve. Do try and keep it simple. Um, don't try and make your share plan do the work of a bonus scheme and a pension scheme at the same time. It, it really won't work. We're always saying to people, try and keep it as simple as you possibly can. A simple plan is easy to put in place. It's cheaper to run and employees understand it better, which means it's usually more of a motivating factor to have a, a simple, straightforward share plan. And then last of all, don't let the tax tail work the commercial dog. A lot of these share plans do have significant tax advantages, but you should never choose a share plan based on the tax advantages that it will give you. Um, particularly the share incentive plan, which can effectively produce a tax rate of zero. That is fine. It's a, it's a fantastic tax advantage plan, but you do need to jump through certain hoops to get that. So you need to make sure that SIP is the right plan for you before you're just driven entirely by the tax advantages of it. So that's the end of the uh, webinar. I'm sorry, I think I might have gone over by a couple of minutes, but um, I hope you find it interesting. If you've got any um, questions, I think you can send them to me on this uh, chat line. Um, I can't see any at the moment, but um, if anything comes up, I'm happy to answer. Um, I think you'll get a follow-up survey from SurveyMonkeys, but we'd really appreciate if you could fill that in and send it back so we can uh, make our webinars uh, more valuable to participants in the future. And if you haven't got any questions for me now, please don't hesitate to get in contact with me. You can get me on the email um, written there or on the um, telephone number at the office, which is 0208 949 5522. I am always happy to speak to people about employee share schemes. I don't think I'm seeing any questions here. So I am hoping that I've answered all your questions.
Um, but as I say, please do get in contact with me if anything arises after you've logged out of this webinar. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye.